Most of our world comes in mixture form, including gases. Consider the atmosphere. This is one of the largest mixtures we have, and it includes nitrogen, oxygen, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and a host of other gases present in trace amounts. While we measure the pressure of the atmosphere in total, we also need to deal with the gases within it individually. In this PowerPoint, we're going to explore how pressure and the ideal gas law can be applied to individual gases within a mixture. To do this, we're going to explore another gas law, Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. Dalton's law states that the total pressure of a mixture of ideal gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of each component gas. Partial pressure is defined as the pressure a component gas would exert by itself under the same conditions of volume and temperature as the mixture. So let's imagine a mixture of gases A, B, and C. The different gas molecules are represented by different colors here. In the mixture, each of those gas particles contribute to the pressure inside the container. At constant temperature and volume, each collision of a gas particle, whether it's particle A, particle B, or particle C, adds to the total measured pressure of 1,350 kilopascals in this particular case. If we were able to separate each gas out, we'd find that the particles of gas A are still exerting a pressure. It's less pressure than the total mixture because there are less particles than there are in the total mixture. But the particles of A are still colliding with the sides of the container, providing pressure. It's the same with the individual gas B and individual gas C. And if we were to add up the individual pressures of each gas, A, B, and C, it would give us the total pressure of the mixture. In this case, pressure of gas A, the partial pressure of gas A, is represented by P sub A. The partial pressure of gas B is represented by P sub B, and the partial pressure of gas C is represented by P sub C. This is another statement of the Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. If we were to substitute our numbers in here for each of these, we'd find that 300 kilopascals for pressure of gas A plus 600 kilopascals for the partial pressure of gas B and 450 kilopascals for the partial pressure of gas C adds up to give us 1,350 kilopascals, the pressure of our total mixture. Let's look at an application of this law. A 5.73 liter flask at 25 degrees Celsius contains 0.0388 moles of nitrogen gas, 0.147 moles of carbon monoxide gas, and 0.0803 moles of hydrogen gas. What are the partial pressures of each gas? And what is the total pressure in the flask? Let's start by calculating the partial pressures of each gas. We can use the ideal gas law to do this. We want to solve for pressure, so we rearrange this law by dividing each side by volume. It cancels out on the left-hand side, and it gives us pressure equals the moles of gas times the ideal gas constant times temperature divided by volume. Now, to solve for partial pressures, we're simply going to substitute in for moles the moles of each of the individual gases given to us in the problem. The overall volume of this container of gas, though, remains constant throughout. It's 5.73 liters. The temperature is also constant at 298.15 Kelvin. And of course, the ideal ga gas constant is 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres divided by moles divided by Kelvin. So to solve first for the partial pressure of nitrogen gas, 
we're going to use these three constants as well as the moles of nitrogen gas given to us in the problem. We substitute this into our rearranged ideal gas law. Notice that moles will cancel out, Kelvin cancels out, and so does liters. This leaves us with atmospheres, 0 0.166 atmospheres. This is the partial pressure due to just nitrogen gas. We do the same calculation for carbon monoxide, but we use the moles of carbon monoxide instead. So substituting this into the equation, again, our units cancel, leaving us with only atmospheres, units of pressure, and we have 0 0.628 atmospheres for the individual partial pressure of carbon monoxide. Finally, we do the same thing for the hydrogen gas. We just use the moles of hydrogen gas. We substitute it into our rearranged ideal gas law. Our units cancel. We're left with 0 0.343 atmospheres for the partial pressure of hydrogen gas. Next, we can calculate the total pressure in the flask using our partial pressures that we calculated with our individual moles. This is because we know that the total pressure in the flask is going to be equal to the sum of the partial pressures of each gas present. This is a statement of Dalton's law of partial pressures. So we add together each of our individual partial pressures and we get a total pressure in the flask of 1.137 atmospheres. So under conditions of constant volume and temperature, the partial pressure of a gas within a mixture depends on the number of moles of that gas. In this particular example, gas A has a smaller partial pressure compared to the other gases in the mixture because there are fewer moles of gas A within that mixture. Mathematically, this relationship can also be stated as the partial pressure of gas A equals the mole fraction of gas A times the total pressure of the mixture, where mole fraction is simply defined as the moles of the individual gas A divided by the total moles of gas within the mixture. So let's look at an example application of this variation on Dalton's law. A diver breathes a heliox mixture from a tank that contains 0.044 moles of oxygen and 0.844 moles of helium. What must the total pressure in the tank be for the partial pressure of oxygen to be 0.21 atmospheres? We know that the partial pressure of oxygen must equal the mole fraction of oxygen times the total pressure. We can calculate the mole fraction as simply the moles of oxygen divided by the total moles of gas in the tank. There are only two gases present, helium and oxygen. So we can substitute in the moles of oxygen that are given in the problem as well as the moles of helium. And from this, we get a mole fraction of 0.0495. Notice that our units of moles cancel out here, and mole fraction is considered unitless. Now we're also given in the problem that the partial pressure of oxygen that we want is 0.21 atmospheres. We're solving for total pressure in this equation, so we can rearrange by dividing both sides by the mole fraction of oxygen, and we end up with the total pressure in the tank must be equal to the partial pressure divided by the mole fraction of oxygen. This is 0.21 atmospheres divided by 0.0495 and it gives us 4.2 atmospheres for the total pressure inside that scuba diving tank. 
An important application of Dalton's law is the collection of gases over water. So a common method for collecting gases produced in a chemical reaction in the laboratory is to bubble them into a flask that was filled with water and inverted into an open container full of water. And as the gas produced in the reaction bubbles into the flask, it displaces the water in the flask. And you can measure the volume of the gas that's produced by the uh, volume measurements, the volume markings on the side of the flask. It's simply equal to the amount of water that's been displaced. You could measure the temperature of the gas that's collected because it's assumed that it's in thermal equilibrium with room temperature. So room temperature equals your temperature. And if you also know the pressure of the gas that's collected, you can calculate the moles of that gas. So the pressure inside the flask, the total pressure is assumed to be the same as the atmospheric pressure. This is because the flask actually is in equilibrium with atmospheric pressure that's pushing down on the water in the open container. So as the water is being pushed down by the atmosphere um, in one direction, it's also being pushed in the opposite direction inside the flask by the gas that's being produced. And when the water stops moving because the gas has stopped being produced, the atmospheric pressure must equal the pressure inside the flask. Now you'll notice that I said the total pressure inside the flask. So that's because the gas present in the flask is actually a mixture of the gas produced in the reaction plus water vapor. So it turns out water is a volatile liquid. And what that means is that at any temperature, a certain number of water molecules will escape from the surface of the liquid water to become gas molecules. And those water molecules exert a small but noticeable partial pressure inside the collection flask. And that partial pressure must be subtracted from the total pressure in the flask to determine the partial pressure of just the gas produced in the reaction. Because this partial pressure is what we need to calculate the moles of gas that are produced in the reaction. If we use the total pressure, we will not be calculating the true number of moles of just gas produced in the reaction. We'll be calculating the moles of gas plus water vapor. So luckily, measurements of vapor pressure due to water at different temperatures are well tabulated, and you can look them up in reference tables like table 9.2 in your text. So let's look at an example of a calculation of the moles of gas collected over water using the vapor pressure of water. So a sample of oxygen gas collected over water at a temperature of 29.0 degrees Celsius and an atmospheric pressure of 764 torr has a volume of 0 0.560 liters. How many moles of oxygen gas were collected if the vapor pressure of water at this temperature is 30.0 torr? So in order to calculate the moles of oxygen, we can use the ideal gas law. We rearrange it to solve for moles, N, and it's simply equal to the partial pressure due just to oxygen gas times the volume of the container divided by the ideal gas constant and divided by temperature. So the volume of the container comes from the problem. It's 0 0.560 liters. The temperature converted into Kelvin is 302.15 Kelvin. The ideal gas constant, of course, is 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres divided by moles divided by Kelvin. And finally, we need the partial pressure due to just oxygen. 
So we know that that is equal to the total pressure inside that flask minus the vapor pressure of water. And the total pressure inside the flask is in equilibrium with atmospheric pressure. So total pressure equals atmospheric pressure, which is 764 torr, minus the vapor pressure of water at 29 degrees Celsius. So that vapor pressure is given to us in the problem as 30 torr. If it weren't given to us in the problem, we could simply look it up in a reference table of vapor pressure of water. The difference between these two values gives us the partial pressure due to just oxygen of 734 torr. Now, pressure does need to be in units of atmospheres for the ideal gas law, so we convert this using our conversion factor of one atmosphere equals 760 torr. Our units of torr cancel out, we get 0 0.9658 atmospheres. And this is the pressure that we substitute into our ideal gas law. Our units cancel so that we're left with simply units of moles. And the moles of oxygen gas produced in this particular reaction are 0 0.0218 moles. So in summary, Dalton's law states that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases within that mixture. And the partial pressure of a gas is equal to the mole fraction of that gas in the mixture times the total pressure. When gases are collected over water in the laboratory, Dalton's law applies as water vapor pressure must be subtracted from the total pressure to get the pressure of just the gas collected.